Welcome everyone to our Cadre Professional Learning Webinar, Assessment in STEM Classrooms, Insights for Researchers and Practitioners. My name is Christopher Harris, and joining me today is a stellar lineup of colleagues who are excited, I, I just know they are, excited to share with you <laughs> uh, the implications and recommendations from the recently released Cadre Report on Classroom-Based STEM assessment. Um, I'm going to handle the very beginning of today's session and begin with a report overview in which I'll talk about the, the genesis of the report. And I'll spend just a little bit of time on that before handing it over to Jim Pellegrino, who will give you um, a more formal introduction uh, to the report that includes actually a more detailed overview. And then from there, we're going to hand it over to the section authors of the report. And you get a chance to hear from each of the, an author from each of the sections who will talk about recommendations and, and a few other details from, from their sections. And then we'll have a, a Q&A uh, session at the end. If we manage the time uh, appropriately, and I'm confident that we can, we'll see if that holds true. But uh, time permitting, we've actually set a time for, uh, for Q&A. Uh, as we go through today's session, some, some questions may come up uh, you know, before we get to that discussion section at the tail end. Uh, and uh, at the bottom of your Zoom uh, screen, there's a Q&A that you can click. And during today's webinar, uh, you are welcome to put in questions uh, for us. We may not be able to answer them in the fly while we're uh, going through our webinar, but uh, we'll be able to address uh, those questions, at least some of them, during the, the Q&A. So please feel free to use the, the Q&A for questions that you would like to direct towards us, the, the presenters. If you put it in the chat, we're not guaranteed that we'll catch it. We'll try. If you really want to have a question for us that we can wrestle with, please be sure to put it in the in the Q&A. Again, that should be at the bottom of your screen. OK, well, let's dive in and give you a sense of where this report came from. So this report, Classroom-Based STEM Assessment, Contemporary Issues and Perspectives, was really driven by, uh, by the cadre, uh, by the cadre network, uh, by and by recent developments in classroom assessment, research and development around classroom-based assessment and the need to consider implications for STEM education. A lot has changed over the last 10 to 15 years about what we know about learning in the STEM disciplines and also what we know about instruction and assessment of, of student learning. And so just over a year ago, uh, we formed a working group to prepare a report on classroom-based assessment in STEM that would be for multiple audiences. Our charge was to consider the existing and emerging knowledge on the integration of assessment into classroom teaching and learning in the STEM disciplines, hence our classroom-based focus for this report. And we were asked also to chart a course for high priority areas. And so as part of our work, we also identified those priority areas and configured them in the, in the form mm -hmm. of, of recommendations. We also had this um, aim to write for a, a, a wide audience. Yes, first and foremost for cadre members, but also to NSF, the STEM education uh, community of researchers, practitioners, and policymakers. So we actually had a really broad, um, a, a really broad audience in mind for this report. To actually get this report off the ground, we formed a steering committee and then invited a working group to join us. The steering committee included uh, Shuchi Grover from Looking Glass Ventures, Jim Pellegrino from the University of Illinois at Chicago, Eric Wiebe from North Carolina State University, and myself from West Ed. The four, the four of us took on the role of editors for this, uh, for this report. And then we worked with a, a, a fabulous group of, of thinkers around classroom-based assessment. And that group included Eric Banelauer from Horizon Research, Art Baruti from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, Aaron Furtak from the University of Colorado Boulder, Leanne Ketterling-Geller, Southern Methodist, 
Seth Jones from Middle Tennessee State University, Oki Lee from NYU, and Zhao Ming Zhai from the University of Georgia. And each of these folks uh, actually led the writing of the different sections of the report. So this is the full team. Uh, the group ended up identifying five uh, topical areas for this report. The sections are, are listed here. The first one focusing on connecting classroom assessment with curriculum and instruction through theories of learning. Um, an, a section on assessment for learning. A section on equity and justice in classroom assessment of STEM learning. Our fourth section, teachers' knowledge and practices for assessment. And our fifth section, technology-based innovative, innovative assessment. And in today's webinar, uh, after we follow our inter, introduction to the report, you'll get a chance to get a to get a, um, a sh very short presentation on each of these sections. I'm now going to hand it over to Jim, who's going to actually introduce the report to us. Uh, thanks, Christopher. Uh, I'm delighted to be part of the webinar today. To um, you know, uh, highlight some of the aspects of the report. What I'm going to try to talk about in the next few minutes is some of the things that uh, we touched upon in the introduction, the introdu introductory section to the report. So, Chris, if you will go to the next one. So, one question is sort of why this report. I want to sort of touch on five things that we highlighted um, that are, you might sort of say, uh, things that we know that have happened in the area of research and policy over the last two decades that really support the, the, the value of doing this uh, synthesis and how it might help us sort of take a look back on what we've accomplished, but also where we need to go. So one of these is we know that, that there's been a changing landscape with respect to policy and practice discussions, particularly regarding what we want students to know and be able to do when they leave the educational system and what is going to be demanded in the way of knowledge and skill with respect to the 21st century. We also know that there have been related changes in the standards uh, and student outcomes, which have been expected, now are expected in the STEM disciplines. You see this in the, the common core standards for mathematics, the next generation science standards, and it's really uh, uh, an emphasis on students being able to use their knowledge in productive ways and transfer and apply that knowledge in, in, in a rich set of circumstances and not just simply recall facts and procedures. Uh, the third thing is, is that we've also learned a great deal more about um, the science underlying the design of educational systems, how to think about assessment uh, and its relationship to theories of learning on instruction, and then how to design those systems so they can support the functions of, of assessment in the education system. And we also have uh, managed to uh, evolve theory and research on the nature and development of STEM disciplinary learning, uh, particularly with respect to uh, topics like learning trajectories and learning progressions, and then the implications of that for classroom instruction and assessment. Now, if we go to the next slide, we'll see the fifth point, which is, um, is I think, a very important point, which is in the larger policy discussions, I think people see the need for a shift from an extensive emphasis on the results of standardized large-scale testing to greater focus on the uses of assessment in the classroom as part of ongoing teaching and learning. Um, so we couple that with two major societal developments that we think are important. One is largely as the result of, of large-scale assessment results in other uh, information, we know there's urgency to address uh, long-standing disparities in opportunity to learn and educational outcomes for underserved and marginalized populations. And with respect to that, we also sort of see that um, there's been a rapid growth now of access to technologies and the development of a variety of computational tools and data analytic approaches that can support the integration of classroom assessment into instructional practices, including what has proven difficult, which is the enactment of formative assessment practices in the classroom. So that's part of the motivation for the report. I'll go to the next slide, which is just reinforcing what Christopher said a little earlier about audience. Uh, the audience for this report, as Christopher said, was members of cadre community, program directors, and project officers at NSF. 
um, as well as STEM education practitioners and policy makers. Um, and we wanted we want the report to accomplish two things. First, we wanted to stimulate dialogue among members of these communities so that they can begin to uh, communicate with each other. How do we think about and what do we need to do to enhance implementation of effective assessment practices in K-12 K STEM classrooms, as well as impact in-service and pre-service teacher education professional learning programs. We think that that is an essential part of where the, the effort needs to go. The second is help, as, as Christopher noted, chart a course for high priorities for the next decade of STEM classroom assessment research, development, and implementation, hopefully to be funded by NSF, but uh, as well as other funded federal agencies and private foundations. So if we go to the next slide, I just want to briefly touch upon <clears throat> what we identified as six major developments that have implications for classroom assessment R&D. Uh, the first of these is uh, something I mentioned earlier. The standards and expectations for STEM, STEM proficiency have changed substantially, and they now demand what we call integrated knowledge of core disciplinary knowledge and practices. And these new standards have major implications for the design and implementation of curriculum instruction and assessment and their coordination. The second thing is, again, something I mentioned earlier, which is that the theories, models, and data on disciplinary knowing and learning have also changed substantially. And we would ar we argue that they are best represented by what we call a broad sociocultural perspective on the general nature of knowing and learning, combined with theory and research on discipline-specific learning progressions. The third is something that has become abundantly clear, which is that the coordination and integration of curriculum instruction and assessment, that is the coordination of all three of these is essential to achieve coherent classroom learning environments. And it's best achieved when all three are derived from conceptual models and empirical data on the nature of disciplinary knowing and learning, as well as a broad sociocultural perspective on the nature of classroom instruction. So if we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up on item number four. As I said earlier, we've learned a great deal about how to think about assessment. It's a process of reasoning from evidence, which is represented by three interconnected elements. Cognition, how we think about knowing and learning. Observation, the things we ask students to do to show us uh, evidence of their learning and interpretation, the ways we can make sense of that evidence relative to drawing inferences about what students know and are able to do. This is critical uh, and critical to the validity of this reasoning from evidence process are the conceptual models and empirical data we have on disciplinary knowing and learning. And that plays a very big role in the report. The fifth thing is that um, essentially Classroom practice, as we've come to understand it with respect to assessment, requires differentiating formative from summative functions of assessment and the ability to implement these practices in an appropriate way. We also know from the literature that formative assessment can significantly impact student learning outcomes, but, but <clears throat> the research tells us that doing so hinges on multiple factors, facets of teachers' assessment literacy knowledge as well as the availability of quality tools um, that teachers can use to support valid and appropriate formative and summative practices. And the last thing we would list in the among these developments is something, again, I alluded to earlier, the affordances of technology to support classroom assessment have greatly increased. This includes interactive and adaptive stimulus materials, response data capture, and the application of data analytic and computational interpretive tools, including machine learning and AI. Now, considerable work remains to be done to effectively integrate these developments into classroom practice, but enormous potential is there. So as, as Christopher put up before, the, there are five topical sections to the report. We'll hear a little bit about uh, each of them coming up. Um, I want to go to the next slide, um, which is essentially uh, why these topical sections? Well, uh, decisions had to be made 
um, by the, the, the entire group involved in this report by a collective sense of where was their substantial bodies of work uh, on critical issues in the integration of assessment into classroom teaching and learning in the STEM disciplines. Uh, so each of the topical areas um, in, in the report has major implications for current practices as well as future research. Christopher, you move forward. And then the each topical synthesis as shown in this next point should be highly productive for stimulating the kinds of conversations that we want to have uh, and for, for stimulating future work, including uh, important integrations uh, across the several different diff developments that I mentioned previously. So collectively, uh, we would argue that the five topical sy syntheses, they cover all six of the developments I mentioned while representing different and important integrations and perspectives on the knowledge and practice of STEM classroom assessment. The inter in this integrate, the, excuse me, this introduction to the report provides some brief summaries of major points from each section, and it also provides brief summaries of relevant R&D that provide the warrants for the six claims um, that we have made regarding important developments impacting STEM classroom assessment. Um, in, in the, uh, I also want to conclude with a, a, a particular coda, which is sort of shown on the next slide, um, which is what we've learned by doing uh, pulling this together. Um, and it's, um, it's that effective use of assessment in the STEM classroom to support student learning is a whole lot more complex and challenging than one might otherwise assume it to be. Well, what's so hard just about implementing classroom assessment in STEM? Well, as the next point uh, notes, it really does require the synthesis and integration of multiple areas of theory and research regarding the knowledge that's to be assessed, teacher knowledge and practice, the complex ecology of the classroom and the kinds of resources and tools for implementation and manage effective implementation and management of classroom assessment. So the five sections of the report really provide multiple perspectives on what we've learned to date for each of the various topic areas, including their integration, while simultaneously identifying directions for much needed future research and development. And then the concluding section of the report provides a summary of recommendations that emerge from each section along with an overall set of implications for research practice and policy. So that's a very quick tour through the introduction to the report. Um, and now I think we're going to segue to hearing a little bit about the recommendations as they apply to each of the sections. So Christopher, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> yes, in this next section of the webinar, uh, we're going to hear from each of the section author teams. We have each uh, each section has an author who's agreed to give a little, provide a little bit of an overview of the section, and then also share recommendations from that section. And I'm going to lead us off. Um, I co-authored with uh, Leanne Carolyn Geller from Southern Methodist on this particular section, Connecting Classroom Assessment with Curriculum and Instruction Through Theories of Learning, and I'll briefly represent that, that section. So this section you know, really emphasizes the importance of aligning classroom assessments with STEM uh, learning goals that are found in standards and often embedded in curriculum alongside, alongside instruction so that they can be used as part of ongoing instruction to monitor students' progress in learning and to support future learning and uh, next steps in teaching. And one centerpiece of this report is a focus on learning progressions or learning trajectories. And many of you may be familiar with uh, uh, progressions and trajectories. They're, um, they describe how students develop greater sophistication within disciplinary topics. Uh, in mathematics education, for example, there's a rich history of learning trajectory work. And in the science and engineering space, and also emerging in computer science and other areas, we see learning progressions um, also beginning to, uh, to emerge and build. They importantly, they're derived from a knowledge base about how learning builds over time in a domain, uh, 
And the STEM community has actually made really tremendous progress over the past 15 years and so in starting to um, delineate different types of progressions or trajectories for across the disciplines. The work is still ongoing. Uh, it's still uh, it's still happening, but we've got some great examples now uh, across STEM across STEM fields, and they offer a compelling and principled way for developing classroom-based assessments. And that's what this section really emphasizes. That is the potential of learning progressions for helping us to develop assessments that are integral to the curriculum that's being implemented and the instruction that's being brought to life in classrooms. So they really do stand to provide insight. You know, assessments that can be developed around progressions and trajectories stand to provide insight into how students' disciplinary knowledge and their practices are developing over time with appropriate instruction. Uh, we have three major recommendations in this section. Uh, the first is something that Jim had mentioned just a, a few minutes ago. It's a recognition that standards and expectations for STEM, STEM proficiency have really changed. And assessments for today's science classrooms need to reflect these contemporary perspectives on learning in the disciplines. So in some respects, we're playing a little bit of, a little bit of catch up, uh, but we've uh, continued to make good progress. And as learning progressions and trajectories continue to be mapped out and empirically validated, it's really important for us to focus research efforts on their use as a framework for informing assessment development, which in turn can inform instructional decision making. This is an effort in part to help shift classroom assessment away from just solely being for monitoring and grading purposes, but also as an opportunity to advance learning, improve the kind of teaching that we do in our classrooms. Uh, but we also have this recommendation about continued research. More research work is needed to help us better understand the ways teachers can generate meaning from assessment results that will in turn transform students' opportunities to learn. So that's, that's section one. Uh, Jim, you may be rep representing section two. So we're going to continue playing a little tennis. I'm going to lob it back to you for the next uh, section. Thanks, Christopher. Um, section two <clears throat> is, is about assessment for learning. Uh, and Art Baruti, who can't be with us today, was the primary author. I helped contribute to the chapter, but uh, Art really was the lead on this. Um, in this chapter, one of the things that we are trying to do is to focus on, um, in particular, on formative assessment. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the chapter essentially goes into a discussion uh, of what's the research base and what's the understanding of the, the of formative assessment as a as a practice, the idea of formative assessment, or sometimes as it's known as assessment for learning. What's the research base on uh, the impact of adopting uh, formative assessment practices in the classroom on student learning? Um, and even sort of uh, discussion of what is the definition or description of formative assessment with <clears throat> focusing on predominantly the, the discussion of formative assessment as not a thing. Um, I like to say it, formative assessment is not a noun, it's a verb, it speaks to a practice in which information is accumulated through a variety of assessment tools and techniques about the status of student learning um, that so that uh, teachers can then act on that to direct the future course of student learning and modify the learning environment. Um, the chapter then essentially goes into examples of the application of uh, learning trajectories and uh, empirical research on learning trajectories, particularly with an emphasis in mathematics and early mathematics that illustrates what it takes to essentially use learning trajectories uh, and the knowledge that has come from empirical research to then develop um, uh, formative assessment tools and implement them in the classroom. And then the interpretation that's needed uh, to make use of that information to improve teaching and learning. So the chapter works through examples of that, uh, as well as the, the complexities that, that, uh, in, that are involved with respect 
to teacher practice, all the things that teachers need to know and be able to do to effectively make use of tools that might come from learning trajectories uh, to develop tools and resources that allow teachers to implement uh, the form a formative assessment practice in their classroom. So <clears throat> you would find in this chapter uh, a, a discussion of the research base that can be applied to understand formative assessment for learning and illustrate its application and use. Um, we also go on to point out that you know, high quality assessment development and validation work is needed for classroom-based assessments that can be used in this way to improve teaching and, and advanced learning. Uh, a great deal more work needs to be done on translating things from learning trajectories into assessment tools and resources, and then validating the inferences that come from that, uh, from those tools with respect to their applicability and utility for, for classroom, um, uh, the, for, for implementing a formative assessment practice. So we, we speak to the issues of validation because even though it's classroom assessment, and if the intent is to use it to improve teaching and learning and act upon it, validity evidence needs to be provided uh, for that intended interpretive use. And it's validity of a variety of sorts, not just with respect to the underlying knowledge and skills, but the capacity for teachers to be able to interpret the meaning of, and the outcomes of the work and then apply it with respect to, uh, to modifying trajectories of learning. Um, we also point out that a, a lot more research is needed about the nature and the efficacy of professional learning programs for supporting teachers to implement formative assessment effectively. Um, uh, in, the, in the section that speaks to <clears throat> teacher knowledge and learning, there's a great deal more discussion of that, but, but we need to understand that it isn't sufficient just to have good tools and resources for, for a classroom assessment, particularly with respect to the formative assessment practice, but there's a lot of professional learning that's needed to help teachers implement and support that. And the last thing we would say, and it, it echoes something that Christopher mentioned based on the first section, uh, that there's a great deal more development and iterative refinement and validation of learning project progressions and, ver and learning trajectories across all the STEM disciplines. We need a lot more work in that area. It needs to continue. And we especially encourage it in emerging areas related to technology, engineering, and computer science education. Um, so I would say overall, we try to uh, uh, clarify the what we know about the assessment for learning process, the practice, what it demands, um, and what else is needed to do uh, along the lines of, of research and, uh, and development to make sure that assessment for learning can be uh, continued to be a powerful factor in, in improving classroom teaching and learning. So with that, I'll, I'll switch it back to whoever is now uh, discussing section three. I'm going to be handing it over in just a moment to to Aaron Furtock, who's going to talk about section three. But before I do, I want to uh, welcome all the the new folks have joined the today's webinar. Great to have you here. And a reminder to folks that if you would like to pose a question to us collectively, down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you have a Q and A button, and you can click that and pose a question. And uh, as we're available, we may try to answer them right in the Q&A space, or we, or we may talk about them during the discussion. Okay, over to you, Erin. Okay, thanks so much, Chris. So I'm really glad to be presenting on chapter, or section three on equity and justice in classroom assessment of STEM learning. Uh, Oki Lee and I wrote this chapter together, and it's been such a pleasure to work with and learn from her as we've been working on this section. We draw our definitions for equity and justice from the 2022 NASM report on science and engineering in preschool through elementary grades, where we think about equity as broadening access and increasing achievement and representation in STEM, and then justice is expanding what constitutes STEM and seeing STEM as part of justice movements. And we kind of adapted this curriculum and instruction and assessment triangle that many of you have seen before to think about how equity and justice could really be put at the center of that relationship. So we're thinking about what equity and justice would look like in all three 
working together and then what the implications are for assessment. So the next slide unpacks how we're thinking about equity and justice for each of these three pieces and uh, thinking about curriculum in terms of centering materials or phenom on phenomena and problems authentic and relevant to learners' lives as a way of thinking about equity. But then if we look toward justice, thinking about how curriculum materials can be developed in partnership with families and communities. So we are looking at phenomena that are really place-based and relevant um, to communities and their lives. And thinking about inst how instruction then can support curricula like this, Speaking about equity, thinking about how we're creating expansive space and instruction for students to share their thinking so they can demonstrate their learning in a variety of ways and for teachers to be responsive to those ideas. And then justice, thinking about how teachers are making space to really reflect on their own experiences, their own histories and identities, thinking about connections to place um, in professional learning settings. So it's kind of looking toward transforming these classroom spaces through instruction as well. And then we think about assessment then as being supportive of these visions of equity and justice in curriculum instruction. So thinking about transformative approaches that are based in communities and places, tasks that center and create space for students' cultural practices and knowledge. And we think about baked in designs where tasks themselves have these affordances in them, particularly to support um, multilingual learners, for example. And then in terms of justice, really thinking about transformative approaches. So we're basing our assessment in communities and places, acknowledging multiple ways of knowing, engaging, representing action and expression. So our final slide kind of summarize these takeaway points, kind of building on these uh, definitions of equity and justice. And Oki and I actually took these definitions and used them to look at projects around assessment in the cadre portfolio. And what you'll see when you read the chapter is that we found that while historically a lot of projects that are in the cadre portfolio have focused on equity in assessment, we're really just starting to see emerging approaches of what it really looks like for assessment in STEM subjects to be focused on justice. And so we really encourage the DRK-12 program to take a more expansive view of, of assessment as part of curriculum and instruction and really to look toward constructing new futures in STEM learning and kind of a transformative vision that is based on these ways of thinking about justice that I just described. We really encourage designers to build assessments in partnership, working deeply and in connection with educators, learners, and communities. And we want to embrace a wider and more inclusive view of what constitutes historically minoritized, minoritized populations. And I'll turn it over to the next group for section four. Okay, great. Section four with, uh, with led by Seth Jones today. Thanks everyone and, and thanks for joining today. I wanna just um, add my thank you to the rest of the presenters and, and also uh, say I'm grateful for the chance to be part of this report uh, with the rest of the authors. Um, I worked on section four along with uh, Shuchi Grover and Eric Bandelauer and we wrote about teachers' knowledge and practices for carrying out the types of assessments that uh, the other presenters have been sharing up until this point. Um, and what we tried to do in our section is to articulate the kinds of, of teaching practices that are necessary for carrying out this kind of high quality formative classroom assessment. Um, and then also to make some recommendations about the kinds of things that, that we think researchers, policymakers, school leaders um, need to be committed to, to support teachers in these practices. Uh, we also, um, uh, like Jim said earlier, are, are explicit about framing this as a practice, uh, not as a set of skills or, or um, uh, things that can be routinized, but things that always uh, have to be negotiated and carried out in local contexts with the uh, students that are um, in those classrooms and in those communities. Um, so uh, uh, laying out kind of how we describe the teaching practices for carrying out these assessments, we talked about three things uh, that, that teachers need to be able to do in their classrooms to to design tasks that provide opportunities to, to make invisible student characteristics that they, they care about uh, visible. So that might be thinking or student dispositions or um, interests um, um, and, and, and tasks that make those things visible in observable actions that the teachers can observe. Uh, the second is to design and carry out uh, questions and, and probing 
um, strategies to elicit that student thinking and give students opportunities uh, to elaborate on what they're thinking and to uh, explain where that rationale is coming from. Um, and then the third is to um, is to use all of that uh, visible activity and and uh, conversation that students are creating from those tasks to use all of that to to make helpful interpretations about uh, invisible student characteristics that are that are changing uh, in response to what's happening in those classroom activities. Um, but as as many people have said up to this point, these practices are very hard to enact, and and we argue in our section that that um, researchers, policymakers, district leaders should should be committed to supporting that kind of assessment work uh, along five lines. Uh, first, as as others have said up to this point, um, teachers need empirically based models of student thinking that are specific to the disciplines that they're working in. Um, when teachers are assessing this uh, thinking in their classrooms, they're, they're making judgments about changes in children that are almost always invisible. So, so teachers need models that can help them uh, anticipate for, plan for, make interpretations for the different ways students are thinking in a particular context. And, and, and we are very clear in our section that, that we don't recommend rigid stages, uh, things that are, that are overly rigid or, or restrict uh, the ways that students might think in a class. And we recognize that these models have often ignored valuable uh, um, ways of thinking that children bring into classrooms from their cultures and communities. So, so this is why we emphasize uh, that these models must be empirically grounded. That highlights that they should be based in evidence on how children are thinking and representative of diverse backgrounds and cultures. Second, teachers need feasible tools and strategies for creating visible evidence of those invisible characteristics. And, and again, we don't mean to suggest that teachers can't come up with strategies um, and techniques on their own, but that, that we should all be a part of giving them the resources that they need uh, to be doing that regularly in their classroom and to integrate it into all of their teaching activities. Uh, third, and, and importantly, in connection to recommendation two, teachers need support in interpreting the diverse and, and many times surprising ways that students uh, respond to those tasks, the strategies that they use, the ideas that they use, and that these supports need to help teachers connect all of the uh, student activity uh, to those models of student thinking. Uh, so that teachers can make informed judgments about what kids are thinking and make good response, uh, uh, good responses uh, to how those students are thinking. Uh, fourth, teachers need much more support to understand how assessment tools have oftentimes in the past not in the past not been used to conduct high quality assessment, but instead assessment tools have often been used to privilege some forms of thinking over others. And, and the reason why that's important to help teachers see is um, so that they can use assessment tools that are being developed now in ways that are much more equitable uh, and that um, pursue justice in the ways that Erin uh, was just talking about in her section. And last, um, there, there's an ever increasing stream of new and innovative technologies designed to support assessment. And teachers need support in understanding these new technologies, understanding uh, how to use them well, the ways that they can inform their work in the classroom and the ways that they can use them in the ways that are uh, best and most responsive to their students that they're working with. So I'll hand it over to Christopher for the last section. All right, well, thank you. And uh, I'm gonna turn and hand it over to Eric who will um, take us through section four. Seth, you, uh, you really provided a lead in here for section five. Uh, uh, so I'm here uh, uh, representing section five. Uh, the lead author, Zamin Tsai, was not able to join us today. So I'll, I'll briefly step through some of these recommendations. As, as Seth finished up his slide, he, he and, and really in a number of his bullets, he references um, further work that needs to be done on developing and deploying tools for formative development. Uh, and I don't need to tell this audience just the um, uh, sort of the, the, um, the and types of new uh, technologically driven tools that are rolling out these days and really at all facets of education and really in our society. Uh, probably most of the news these days are tools based 
artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and sort of coupled with them are uh, real-time assessment uh, tools, digital technologies, tools, what sort of, you, you might broadly call them sensor technologies. Uh, those sensors, in a sense, could be wired to the computer. They can be video-based. Uh, they can be uh, based in uh, any number of possible data streams to help us, as Seth mentioned, um, better uh, interpret the, the visible, what we see unfolding in the classroom and on computers uh, to better understand the invisible that lays underneath it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to point out that uh, these technologies can play a role um, in collecting data, in analyzing data, in presenting data, um, in interpreting and modeling that data. Uh, but uh, it uh, it can also be used on the front end for formative assessment as uh, shaping the really the stimuli, the the sort of the assessment environment that students are uh, interacting with. Uh, so this is where augmented reality and virtual reality perhaps comes in, but also other uh, interactive techniques. So we really need to continue R and D work, and that R and D work. I, I can't emphasize this enough that the technology, if we think of it as a wave, that we always feel like that wave is about to sort of wash over top of us. And we need to find a way uh, the best we can in our own uh, sort of confines of educational research practice uh, to surf the top edge of that wave, to look at the amazing potential with these technologies but don't start with the technological capabilities, but start with the problems of practice, the problems of form of assessment that we have and say, what emerging tools are out there? Can we uh, utilize, can we modify, can we deploy to answer these uh, longstanding pressing aspirational problems that we have around formative assessment? And it's really gonna take cross-disciplinary teams more than ever. I mean always assessment has involved uh, practitioners and researchers, specialists in education, uh, in curriculum development, in teaching, in psychometrics to best deploy assessment tools. But now, quite frankly, we also need computer scientists and, and other technologists who understand these emerging technologies. Um, and we need to understand uh, how is this technology going to be deployed? Is it is this a tool for the teacher? Is this a tool that's going to work directly with students? This is going to be an intelligent tutor say that's going to work directly with the student. How is this data going to flow? How is the student going to receive this data? How is the teacher going to receive this data? Is this going to be interpreted real time? Is or is this going to be um, utilized at the end of the class period, at the end of the week, at the end of the unit? Um, how are these tools going to work with teachers? Of course, the most exciting possibilities, of course, is what can be done real time in the classroom as teaching and learning is unfolding in those spaces. Uh, but I'll stop there and uh, toss it back to uh, Christopher. Again. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks, uh, all the section authors who represented uh, their recommendations and their, and their author team. Um, we're going to transition now to uh, discussion, question and answer. And uh, um, during this during this next uh, portion of the webinar, you're welcome to put questions or comments into the Q and A down at the at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Also, we did receive some questions in advance uh, from from folks, and so um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Shuchi and Eric to help facilitate this uh, this discussion. Suchi, do we believe that we uh, have any open questions uh, in Q&A still, or have we largely covered them? Uh, there is one open question. Um, uh, it's about, can perceptions be used as a proxy for learning? Uh, you know, uh, he, uh, Omer Shezad is relating this to practical measures, which often mm -hmm. focus on improving student perceptions toward classroom instruction. Did you find any relationship between students' perceptions of learning and their actual learning? So we did not do any research as part of this, 
But I guess what Omer may be wanting to uh, know is if there is any research that has been done around this. And I don't know if any of us were able to answer it or if we didn't get to it, but it's- Yeah, I, you know, I find if, if you just sort of step back a couple levels or move up a couple levels, I, I, I am very happy to stand behind the claim that affect and cognition go go hand in hand in le learning and that they are distinct entities. They can be measured separately, but ultimately they work hand in hand in moving learning forward. So you know, self-efficacy and motivation, uh, other dimensions of affect, including just you know, levels of engagement, uh, uh, excitement, interest, satisfaction. We can put any number of words to these things. All of these things are important engines for, for sort of moving students forward cognitively uh, and putting that effort uh, towards, you know, positive cognitive effort towards, towards learning. Teachers need to be aware of both these dimensions. Both of them, in my mind, do need to be measured. Uh, but it is also super challenging, even even, even uh, for researchers of a long arc to both disentangle affect and cognition, but put them back together again to better understand what actually unfolded during a particular learning session. So to be able to claim that we knew how to do this real time in the classroom, uh, I think would be would be wrong. I think it's an area ripe for research, but perhaps others want to dive in on this. Mm -hmm. And the one I would I would mention, Eric, is that um, if one adopts a, a socio-cultural framing of uh, essentially learning and instruction, it integrates not just the cognitive part, that is the knowledge, but the issue of student motivations, interests, engagement, and identity. So it is yeah. the case that when you have learning environments that are uh, highly productive and engaging, student interest and, uh, and attitudes come along with uh, uh, the, the kinds of learning outcomes we want. Uh, it's, um, I mean, they co-vary and they should, um, because when you have a, a, a rich socio-culturally uh, um, stimulating uh, learning environment in which students are engaged with each other, with their teachers, with the disciplinary knowledge, then those things are going to co-vary. I would not see them, however, as a proxy for learning, but they are uh, actually intimately related to what else is happening in the learning environment that, that brings in the, the, the affective, the motivational, as well as the cognitive outcomes. And just to add to that, I think the formative assessment literature does speak to the issue of making bringing students along in the process of formative assessment, making them very much a part of this peer assessment, self-assessment, making formative assessment sort of part of the classroom culture so that they are invested in the process. They don't see it as, you know, testing or anything stressful. It's just part of the process, whatever those assessment strategies are, whatever the, those kinds of tasks or probes are, they very much you know, are part of it and buy into it as well. So that also sort of speaks to the engagement of students, not just in the learning, pro you know, not in, in the learning process, but also in this process of giving feedback on what they have learned um, to each other and uh, to the teacher. I mean, I would certainly say that, that I believe that there's a very important equity and justice facet to this, that I think that, um, you know, one of the things that historically has, has has not been attended to well is the diversity of response to um, uh, teaching and learning moments in the classroom and that uh, uh, elements such as identity and one's motivation or engagement to particular activities in the classroom are going to really vary widely across students. And of course, it's a huge challenge for teachers to try to figure out how do we uh, tune curricula in teaching in such a way that there are opportunities for all students in the classroom to have uh, equally positive affective responses to that learning opportunity. And I, I would hope that formative assessment can help uh, help us with that. Erin, perhaps you have some other thoughts on that. I have nothing to add in particular. I think I was at the moment 
just reading through the the other questions. Oh, oh sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that was okay. I think there can be a broad uh, announcement made about resources. Uh, somebody has asked a very pertinent question about, you know, the resources that are being shared as part of this webinar. Are they in the report? And I believe if they're not, I think there is uh, uh, some plan afoot to add, uh, you know, resource links uh, that come out of this Q&A um, as part of the webinar links, uh, wherever Cadre posts. Uh, is, am I right? Can somebody from Cadre confirm that? Yes, we'll do that for sure. And, okay. and send that information when we send out the recording to all registrants. All right. Um, and, and Aaron, you um, you you have a book that uh, recently released that, that speaks to, I mean, I'm looking over the Q&A that came in with the registrants. Many of these questions are really practitioner focused around how do we actually do this in the classroom? And my my sense is that your report of potentially is a great risk for that, and maybe you can drop that in chat or in the Q and A. Yeah, I'm happy to drop a link to that in the chat, and I also um, to to the, the the book, and I also wanted to note that in the um, the the chapter that Oki and I wrote, section three. We also point to several ongoing projects in the cadre portfolio. Um, that are are doing this work focusing on equity and justice in STEM assessment. And we worked to identify examples that are in each of the S, T, E, and M domains of the all. So it's all mm -hmm. of STEM. And so people can kind of see how curriculum and instruction and assessment are working together. And if you go look specifically at those projects, there's a lot of really wonderful resources for um, how to co-design uh, assessments in partnership with communities, what these assessments look like, uh, you know, the kinds of instructional resources to kind of some of the points that were being raised a moment ago can look like that also uh, support teachers in, in learning how to do this and also support people designing assessments in STEM to, to think about how to engage in this work. And it, it made me think of a question that I did see in the, the comments that, or the, the questions that were submitted prior to the webinar, which is about how to adapt uh, STEM assessment practices for more diverse populations. And I wanted to respond to that with those examples and also to encourage us to think about how we want to not think about having a set of assessment practices and then adapting them, but really how we're developing assessments in partnership with and for all learners and particularly those who come from populations that have been held at the margins in the past, um, neurodiverse learners, multilingual learners, learners of color, learners living in poverty, how we can actually put the interests and assets of these students at the center of our assessment design and instructional practices. So we're not adapting, but we're actually reframing the goals of what we're trying to do with assessment in the first place. Suchi, did you see some questions that were previously submitted that um, we've had a few highlighted? Did you see any there that maybe might complement some of the things we've been talking about? Sure. I, I think there are a couple. Uh, there's a lot of how-to questions, and I think those probably point to more research. I think one of the things we have sort of tried to underscore through this report is that there is a lot more research that needs to be done to get answers to these very nitty gritty how to questions. Uh, and this report is very much aimed at NSF and for them to frame a research uh, agenda. But there is a question here that's interesting. Uh, that's about what barriers exist to turning assessment data collected through large scale systems into research data. And I don't know if that is very pertinent to formative assessment, but it speaks to this this um, broader question, maybe about uh, you know how we might be able to use what's out there for ongoing research on assessments. Anybody? Uh, can I, I? I'm I'm trying to uh, understand the nature of that question, since I, you know I think that individuals have to recognize that much of what we get from large scale assessment in the way of, of the data that we get is at a level that is that is very far away from removed from classroom practice um, and typically does not have 
um, the capacity to really support deep inferences about classroom teaching and learning. Um, and and it's, it's inevitable given the nature of the designs and limitations of large scale assessment. So I, I think that in the larger community, as we consider uh, large scale assessments in STEM, as well as then classroom assessments and things like that, that we have to understand the inherent interpretive limitations that come from um, large scale assessments. We can always make them better. We can always make them more relevant uh, and less biased. But the uh, I think the community has begun to really recognize in the limitations on uh, the data that we can get from large scale assessments, with one exception, which is when we have interesting uh, STEM related performance tasks and we are, are able to dis disseminate examples of the kinds of responses that students make and the scoring of that, that can be extremely helpful for, for classroom practice because it illustrates the kinds of intellectual demands and outcomes we want students to be capable of, of demonstrating. And there's a, a rich data source for that with things like uh, the NAEP items and NAEP tasks in STEM. So it's a question of how you want to think about large scale assessment and what it can provide in the way of affordances to, to assist with respect to classroom assessment as well as classroom teaching and learning. Um, I'm going to step in because uh, it's hard to believe, but we have just have a couple of minutes remaining in today's webinar, and I want to extend a huge thank to uh, all of the panelists who presented today and engaged in discussion. Uh, extend a, a, a big thanks to all the attendees, and uh, I want to call out all the people who posed questions for us and were very interactive with us during today's session. And of course, I would be remiss in not recognizing the work of uh, the folks at EDC, the Education Development Center, who as part of the cadre network are, is supporting today's webinar. Now, maybe you're attending today's webinar because you're thinking, you know, I wanna learn more about this report and then I'll decide if I will read it. Well, I just put up on the screen the links to the report. They're very long. Uh, you can actually go to the cadre website. There's links there. There's been cadre uh, emails to folks also with links. You can read the full report if you'd like. It's comprehensive and very ambitious, but maybe you just want the executive summary. We've got that for you too. And if really you just wanna revisit the recommendations that we spoke about today, you can look just at those. Those three sources are here on behalf of, of me and all of my colleagues, everyone involved in this. Big thanks for uh, joining us today. Yeah, so let me uh, jump in and say, uh, you know, you can just jump into the executive summary, but the full report is organized in such a way that you really can just read sections of it. And each section is standalone in its own right, very digestible in its own right, including the introduction, which which provides a great sort of um, but both history and summary of, of formative assessment and where we stand. So there are many ways for approaching the material that we've put together. I also would like to second that Without cadre, none of this would have happened today. So, or for it. So, thank right. you. Support your cadre. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Eric. That's a really good point. The, re re the full report is really worth reading. I didn't want to uh, make it seem like you should skip it. But, uh, but thanks, everyone. <laughs> thanks, Carla, for your comment <laughs> about cadre. <laughs> Great to see many thanks people. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs>